Kinesis. I've got a patient who's hypotensive. Do I give them fluids or pressors? That's kind of like my first branch point in my head when I've got a patient with hypotension. And I can help that branch point one way or the other using this kinesis assessment. Well, I'm going to look at the mitral valve, the anterior septal leaf of the mitral valve, and how well that comes up and smacks into the septum of the heart. I'm also going to look at the sequentiality of the aortic valve and the mitral valve, how well they work together. And I'm going to look at the LV and sort of how much squeeze is going on in the LV. Okay, so here's how I do this. Here's the, and I do this in the personal long, which is actually my favorite window of the heart. And one of my favorite things to ever do on any, with any ultrasound is a, is a personal long axis. You can see here the apex is kind of hanging off this way. Indicators the patient's left elbow. That's why we're doing this personal long. Here's the RV. Here's the LV. This is the LA. Here's that anterior septal leaf of the mitral valve. Now I'm going to focus on this area right here first, and I'm going to see how well that septum comes up and that septal leaflet comes up and smacks that septum. If it does, great, which it's doing, good. And the sequentiality between the mitral valve and the aortic valve. Do they fire at the same time, or is it sequentiality? I see some pretty good sequentiality there. Then I come over here and I look at the septum and the posterior wall. How, uh, shoot, hold on. How well did these two things um, contract towards one another? So here's the septum, here's the posterior wall. Do they squeeze together? Yeah, pretty well. So this person right here has got a normal LV function because of the, sep the motion of that septal leaflet hitting the septum of the heart and the septum and the posterior wall coming together. Now let's look at another heart and do the same thing. How's that septum, septal leaflet doing? Is it coming up and smacking this, this interventricular septum? You know what, it gets very close. It's got some good movement. I'm gonna say yes. Okay, is there sequentiality? You know, I don't think so. They seem to both kind of fire at the same time. So I don't see like one than the other. Then I'm gonna move on here. So first of all, we look there and we see good, decent anterior septal leaflet movement, but we see loss of sequentiality. Then we come over here to the posterior wall and the interventricular septum. Are they squeezing together? not very well. They're not coming together and making that big squeeze the way that the other heart did. That posterior wall and septum are not really moving much at all. And in fact, the tip off here is that that septum is extremely thick. This is a patient with um, cardiomyopathy. And so whenever you can see the heart that beautifully, I'm always a little suspicious because big cardiomyopathic hearts are beautiful on ultrasound. They come across like this. You can see them very well. And so right off the bat, I'm a little suspicious. So if this patient was hypotensive in my ED, I would really consider inotropic therapy, as opposed to that last patient that we saw that had normal LV function, if their blood pressure was 70 or 80, I would really be considering what? Fluids. Okay, what about this? How's that septal wall doing? This isn't the best view of the heart, but even though it's a little squished, I'm not seeing it come up here to the septum. Okay, so right off the bat, there's a problem. And by the way, the reason why I look at that it's the physical mechanics of the flow of the blood going from the RA to the RV. As it moves through that from RA to RV, I'm sorry, you're right, LA to LV, as it's being sucked through that valve, it smacks that valve up against the septum. If it's going through with a good enough velocity to do that, good enough pressure change from that LV working so well, it causes that septum to, that septal leaflet to smack the septum. So when it's not doing that, we know there's decreased LV function. Does that make sense? So then we come over here to look at the posterior wall. How well is that posterior wall hitting that septum? Not at all, right? It's basically, I'm surprised the patient even has a blood pressure sometimes when I see these things. So this is definitely a low ejection fraction qualitatively, I can say that. Quantitatively, I'd have to drop a bunch of discs or do the Tykholtz method or do some other fancy calculations that takes a little bit of time. I don't really have the time to do that a lot of times. And so I just look at these things qualitatively and decide if it's a low ejection fraction or not in the setting of hypotension. How about this next one? Okay, septal leaflet coming up. Pretty good, hitting that septum pretty well. Okay, good sequentiality going on. How about the LV and the um, septum, interventricular septum? Yeah, the, the heart is emptying with each beat. See how they come, they actually touch each other there. And when they touch each other like that, and this patient's blood pressure is 70, I know that I need to right away get some fluids going, right? This is a dry heart. It needs some fluids. A normal EF that's very thirsty heart. This is just a very obvious example here of very low ejection fraction. Um, I'm wondering to myself, does this patient have a, have a pulse? 
They've got uh, basically no septal anterior septal leaflet motion at all. And um, I don't know what's going on over here, that posterior wall and the septum. I'm thinking inotropic therapy, you know, right away if this patient's going to survive. Also, the RV looks very big compared to the LV, and I'm thinking about, you know, clinically, does this fit into a picture of pulmonary embolism with the rest of the patient's presentation factors? How about this one here? Normal. I know I'm running low on time here, so I'm going to wrap it up, but this is the septal leaflet of the mitral valve coming up smack in the septum of the heart. Um, it's kind of hard to see the aortic valve. I'm not sure if there's sequentiality here, but I'll tell you what, that septum comes in and squeezes pretty close to that posterior wall, and this makes me feel pretty comfortable that this ejection fraction is normal. How we doing here? Bad. Bad. Yeah. Does that does that valve come up and hit the septum? Nope. There's some pretty decent looking sequentiality, but it's not moving much. How about back here? Do we see the septum coming into the LV? Nope. This is really easy to do. You can do a kinesis assessment very simply at the bedside. Anytime you've got a patient who's got hypotension, it's indicated to do this. How about this one? See how that septum is not even moving? I mean, that septal wall? Septal wall. Septal leaflet, thank you. It's not even coming up to this septum at all. And then these two things are just not squeezing together. Any questions about kinesis before I move on? Okay. This was a two-day-old. They came in when I was doing my fellowship to Christ Hospital in Chicago. Came in with cyanosis. We did this sub-xiphoid view of the heart. This is the liver here. These are the atria. And this is the single ventricle. The differential diagnosis of a septic, of a cyanotic neonate is pretty big. Lots of different things that can cause it. Um, this happened to be a congenital heart defect that caused it. And so we were able to, very early on in the care of this patient, um, appropriately disposition them and call the right people. And the patient survived. We wrote it up as a case report. What's the diagnosis? Yeah, I like that. Tamponade, why? Huge clot there. So if this is the liver, and this is the right ventricle, left ventricle, this is what view of the heart? Subxiphoid. The pericardium's out here. This is all isocoal clot. If this happens, and we see this in our trauma bay, what do we need to do? Okay, so if his vital signs are unstable, we do, and he's arresting, arrested, we do a thoracotomy, absolutely. If he's stable enough, he can go to the OR for a sternotomy thoracotomy. However, the one thing you don't do here is, if, if, if you work in a trauma center, the one thing you don't do is a pericardiocentesis, okay? Because that's not going to get the clot out of there, is it? The question is, what do you do if you have this and you're not at a trauma center where a trauma surgeon can come and bail you out of a thoracotomy, and I don't know the answer to that question. It's a tough question. It comes up when I'm teaching a lot, but all I know is that this really requires a surgical fix and not a procedural fix the majority of the time. If I were in a non-trauma center, I would do a pericardiocentesis recognizing that it's likely futile, but who knows what you're going to get and you can't kill a dead person. The next question is, would you inject any heparin into that pericardium once you were in there or any urokinase or anything to that pericardial area? Wouldn't work fast enough. Okay. This is dead in three minutes. Should you wash it with saline and try to break it up with something? I don't know. People always ask me these questions. I never know the answer to it. Do you stick a guide wire down there and just start <laughs> I don't know. Mush it up a little bit. Turn up the ultrasound. Uh, the power on the ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Pulverize it. Just start doing precordial thumps. I don't know the answer, but how about this one? Tough to tell. So this is the pericardium over here. I know you start to sound like a radiologist, clinically correlate. This is the, uh, the RA. The RV is squished. 
The RV is really hard to see. It's, it's actually squished. So this is tamponade. The question is, what is in here? Is it fat or is it clot? I mentioned briefly that fat is usually no greater than one centimeter in thickness. These are centimeter hash marks. Is the distance between the myocardium and the pericardium more than one centimeter? Yeah. Absolutely. So right off the bat, I'm very curious. Is this isoechoic or heterogenic? Clot, I mean, um, fat moves with the heart as heterogenic. Clot is isoechoic. Looks like the liver or the, you know, thyroid. What do you think? This is clot. Hard to differentiate the two, and you're going to run across this more than really anything else. A fat should not cause the ventricle to collapse. No, very good point. So I see the trampolining ventricle. I see more than one centimeter thickness. I see an isoechoic substance in the pericardium, and I really start to make the case that this is a clot. And I see that the patient had a transmediastinal gunshot wound. No, I'm just kidding. Clinically, I am correlating. Okay, last slide. Is this per second to last slide? Is this pericardial or pleural effusion? This is the peristernal long axis of the heart, RV, LV, LA. Okay, the myocardium is back here. Is that also the pericardium? Is that white line the pericardium or not? The answer is yes. This is posterior to the descending aorta. This fluid comes along, as Dr. Landorf is saying here posterior to the descending aorta, and therefore, this is a pleural effusion. Confusing. I agree. It looks just like a pericardial effusion. If it wasn't for that descending aorta, how do I normally diagnose a pleural effusion on the left? Simple. I go into my, uh, my fast exam window, looking at the spleen and the diaphragm. I look superior to the diaphragm, and if I don't see the mirror image artifact of the spleen up in the chest, if I see a, all this black stuff on top of the diaphragm, looking coronally, laterally, with the P21 probe, then I know, with the same probe I'm using for this, I know that this is, confirms to me that this is plural. I always do that. Yeah, I mean, the problem is when you get a gunshot wound to the chest and you could have both a pericardial effusion and a pleural effusion, then, then you're really stuck. Because, exactly, because the pericardium can drain into the pleura. Yeah. Or it could have both of them. Tamponade could be your problem, or hemothorax could be your problem, or both. Yep, and then it's thoracotomy. Dorchotomy time, yeah. Okay, guys. Turns out emergency physicians have a pretty low success rate of floating transvenous pacemakers blinded. You watch cardiologists do it, they do it like they could do it in their sleep. They do it like they're blinded. But um, they're so good at it. But emergency physicians, we struggle with this. Every once in a while, you get the patient who just, you can't transthoracically pace them. And their blood pressure is very low because of their bradycardia. And now it's time to fix that with electricity. But transthoracically, you just can't do it. So then that's the indication to do a transvenous pacemaker. There's a couple of others, but that's the main sort of clinical pickle that you end up in. Well, on ultrasound, you can see the guide wires coming into the RV. Not only can you help guide the guide wire in under, sub, this is a sub-xiphoid view, because um, that's the liver. Not only can you guide the guide wire, but you can also see when the electrical activity becomes mechanical capture as well. And so you can see all of a sudden when you get in the right spot and when you start to see the heart become mechanically captured. I wish I had the earlier part of this clip where the guide wire was coming in and then all of a sudden it started to capture, but nobody recorded that part of it. So that's what a transvenous pacemaker looks like. It's just something to consider if you're in the heat of the battle and you're trying to float this transvenous pacemaker somewhere, wherever you are, think about looking at it under ultrasound guidance so you can turn it and guide it to get it in that spot. Those pacing wires make very good reflectors of ultrasound. So bottom line, scan, try to scan each patient at least two planes. If you're, you know, parasternal long and sub -xiphoid, my two favorites, those, two, those are the ones I go back and forth between. If I can't get sub because the liver's too small, then I'm going apical and parasternal. Um, any patient who's short of breath, hypotensive, anytime you're coding a patient, and, of course, you want to save the windows. Any questions about cardiac ultrasound? All right, that's all I got. Thank you.